When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Chip Nellinger out of Blue Reef Agri-Marketing in Morton, Illinois. Chip, how are you doing this morning? Hey, doing good, Casey. I like your poll over there. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I tried to add a G to your name, but other than that, it's, <laughs> it was good. So That's all right. <laughs> crazy week this week. We've had a lot of stuff going on. You had the USD report come out last week. We had some reactions to the soybean market we saw there. You've had you know cattle prices kind of take a, take a puke here over the last a couple of weeks they really got hammered last week as you started looking at some funds doing some liquidations and you got the uh weather conditions down in brazil so a lot of stuff to talk about as usual but i think probably the best place to start is what uh kind of set the tone for the end of the week last week is the usda report when it came out um i guess chip as you look at overall supply and demand and what we saw come out of there and stocks in stocks and those kind of things any big shockers to you that you saw come out of that report yeah i, I think uh, it, it ended up being a little bit of a shocker with corn yields, um, you know, being up, uh, what were they, up 1.9 to 174.9, um, and that's going to end up being a bigger crop than a year ago. That was a little bit of a shocker uh, to me, um, and it added, you know, to the bottom line on the carryout. Uh, they did raise um, corn demand by $125 million, and the corn market, uh, even though it sold off into the report, really was... Uh, kind of a bummer there on Thursday and Friday. It really deflated the uh, the corn market, pushed down into new lows, uh, you know, about three-year lows. Um, and so far, the corn market, you mentioned the, the Brazil weather situation. Um, you know, in my mind, it very much does affect the corn market. But right now, uh, corn could care less about the weather issues in uh, Brazil, and, uh, in particular in South America, to a lesser extent. And they're more focused on yields going up and uh, it was really uh, kind of a bearish take on it. Bean yields up three tenths of a bushel, about as expected. Um, no major change there. Uh, small bump up on carryout, but the bean market is way more focused on this current uh, Brazil weather situation because it immediately affects uh, bean yields. Whereas the second crop corn uh, down in Brazil, that's not planted until March. And so, um, you know, with good reason, I guess, that's why the corn market isn't uh, too concerned with, uh, with South American weather. And the bean market has been much firmer, even with yields going up a little bit on that report last week. Yeah, so Casey, the, the big takeaway from that report, uh, I guess, was the, the bigger than expected increase uh, in, in corn yields and, um, you know, really kind of pushing corn prices down into fresh lows for this move under 470. Uh, so I really kind of took the, the wind out of the sails of the corn market. Uh, beans, however, you know, they're more focused on uh, the current Brazil weather situation right now than the three-tenths of a bushel increase in yields. And, you know, kind of starting the new week out, we've got uh, all that focus down in Brazil. And, and uh, uh, El Nino is just really throwing them for a loop with their weather patterns early in their growing season. For sure. So that situation in Brazil, I'm glad you brought that up, is getting as a good friend of mine likes to say, very Western. So it's uh, if you take a look at what's going on there, you're looking at some situations that are, they're already headed into a, a, a typical dry season anyway, just because of the way things are shaping up. And then you throw the El Nino situation on top of it and some other things that are going on there. 
man, I tell you what, there's, there's an opportunity that we look and see that where they could really have an issue. And, and we've kind of seen that with China over here the last week or whatever. When they bought 10 cargo loads of, of, of uh, soybeans just last week. And, and there's talk that they're going to do the same thing again this week. We haven't seen anything come through yet, but I guess, I mean, that situation is getting to the point now where that's got to start playing in uh, into the minds of, of the traders as we're looking at what's going on, moving into this, you know, very high uh, export season for the United States. Yeah, and it's all kind of coming together at once. It's a very real situation. It seemed like for the entire month of October, the, the market wasn't uh, concerned with it. And, and I think in general, the market does a pretty good job of waiting to figure out, is this a real situation or is it not? And, and it is uh, it is very much a real situation uh, in Brazil. It's kind of an odd, uh, you know, really strange occurrence. Very strong El Nino in the northern two-thirds of Brazil when, when there is a strong El Nino does have a tendency to be a little bit on the dry side. It's very odd with, uh, you know, being a, essentially a rainforest that uh, you have the drought that uh, the northern two-thirds of Brazil is experiencing right now. In fact, this week, uh, they're uh, set to have some potential record heat there. So it's going to be well yeah. over 100 degrees. So it's a double, almost triple whammy. Number one, um, the beans that did get planted, um, Super hot, super dry. I've seen uh, pictures down there. You know, obviously drought situation, uh, yield potential dropping. But they stopped planting because they didn't have enough moisture uh, in the ground to germinate the seed. Uh, and so they're way behind on planting. So they still have beans to plant. And then the southern part of Brazil, which is kind of more, uh, you know, the, the heartland, so to speak, kind of the I-State type production area, uh, they had uh, record amounts of rainfall. Um, historic flooding so it's the exact opposite in the southern third of brazil they're going to get three to ten plus inches of rain there this week uh there's beans left to plant uh there's beans that need replanted because of the moisture and they're getting um they have a longer growing season than we do it's there's more margin for air but then you get to the situation where they have to get their beans in in the ground timely or they miss the window to plant their second crop corn and so uh, it's all in the mix. They've got uh, seven to 10 days of this heat and dryness. There's some hints in the long range weather that maybe two weeks out, they start getting a little bit better rainfall in the dry areas. Um, but, you know, we're deep enough into November that it is really starting to matter to the market. So the market's uh, very concerned about that. They've, uh, you know, pushed beans up. Uh, into some uh, initial resistance that was uh, in the low 1380s. We backed off from there going into the report last week. And then you mentioned these big purchases by uh, by China, right? They're, uh, they are sly foxes. Um, you know, we've got the meeting between uh, President uh, Xi yeah. and Biden this week in San Francisco. And ahead of that, as oftentimes happens, um, you know, whether it's here or anywhere they go, there's some goodwill gestures made, right? There's some big purchases and some announcements. And so there's a thought process that these big purchases, almost 3 million tons of uh, beans uh, purchased, some of their biggest in years from the United States, purchased in the last week ahead of this meeting. Well, yeah, it's a gesture of goodwill, but don't think for a second that some smart people in China aren't watching the weather in Brazil thinking if this uh, drought continues into December, you're really going to start whacking uh, the bean yield potential out of this uh, Brazil bean crop, and we might need these beans from the United States. So kind of served a double purpose, I think, for China. Goodwill, some of the biggest purchases of beans they've had from the United States in years, but they, you know, I think have a very real need for those beans as well. Right. Yeah, very true statement. Uh, it, there's, uh, they never do anything on accident. It's always on purpose. So that is... Always, uh, <laughs> There's always meaning behind it, and yes, uh, nothing's is. done uh, for for no reason with yeah. them. Very true statement. All right, let's jump over and talk about what's going over in the livestock area, especially on the cattle side. Cattle side has been taking a beating here the last two, three weeks, and last week was a really good beating part of that. So I guess as you take a look at that chip, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, we have had uh, a big reversal of fortunes uh, quickly in the cattle market, and you know, I know you and I have talked about uh, this for, you know, months, right? Like uh, a top was coming at some point in time. 
probably sooner rather than later. Uh, no one rings a bell and says, hey, here's the top. It always comes uh, when it's the most bullish. And, you know, it's almost textbook uh, in, in the cattle market. And um, the funds have been long, the cattle market, feeders and live cattle for uh, probably the better part of 18 months. They've made a tremendous uh, amount of money being long cattle and buying every break. And, uh, you know, for the looks of it, for all intents and purposes, it looks like they are done being long in uh, live cattle and feeder cattle. A little bit of a concern, whatever the reason is, right? We've had a couple months of, of uh, and there's several excuses uh, you could put out there. We've had a couple months in a row of some bigger numbers than expected on the cattle on feed numbers. We've had export demand that's really struggled. We've had box beef kind of come off the highs. Uh, still at very high levels, but well off the highs. Uh, we've had some problems and some concerns about the, the U.S. consumer and the world economy and record high beef prices. Uh, whatever it is, the funds decided over the last uh, three weeks, really, a, we've had a lot of fun uh, and made a lot of money being long cattle, but we're done with it. And uh, when they get in and out of things, they, they don't do it uh, slowly and they don't uh, do it in uh, light volume. So. Uh, massive amounts of selling. Now we flipped the basis, meaning that the cash market has dropped, but way less than what the futures have. So basis, um, you know, has had a six, eight dollar swing in many areas, and the cash market has come down some. But uh, the fight is on now between, you know, if the cash market can hold together, you're going to see a big snapback in cattle prices in here, uh, six, eight bucks, uh, maybe ten bucks, very quickly. If the futures stay weak. And and feedlots lose a little bit of leverage and give in and cash, um, you know, sets back some more. That could kind of be, um, you know, create its own momentum because the funds uh, do have uh, more to liquidate. The due to um, uh, Veterans Day on Friday, the, uh, the U.S. government observed Veterans Day on Friday, so the government offices were closed. We didn't get the commitment to traders report out. And uh, so we'll get that out this afternoon. That'll tell us what uh, where the what the funds have done and how much more approximately they have to come out of that. So it's a big change of uh, ownership here uh, in the last three weeks. Funds have been massive sellers in the cattle complex. We've had you know just massive volati volatility intraday. Twenty five bucks off the highs in live cattle, probably fifty plus dollars off the highs in the feeders. Um, I think we're closer to some fair balance, but Boy, you've seen a massive increase in the volatility. I mean, six, seven dollar plus ranges in both live cattle and feeder cattle uh, from high to low, and sometimes it's a it's a two way round trip, and uh, so it's gotten very challenging, very difficult. Uh, I, I think we're stretched to the downside, uh, probably too cheap for really where the cash market should be fundamentally, uh, and so you could see another snapback of the futures, but. Uh, it's it's been a violent ride in the cattle complex for like uh, yeah, about the last three been, weeks. Just watching it, just every day was <clears throat> worse than the day before. So it's it's uh, definitely something to keep your eye on. Let's talk about hogs over here. So you look at the hog markets going on there. What are your thoughts on that on that part of the of the livestock sector? Yeah, ho hogs have held together. Um, they've been a, a little bit quieter uh, market than the than the cattle complex uh, has been. There has been some back and forth. I think it's you know kind of a uh, a period of time where we we've kind of found some fair value in here, and the numbers have grown a little bit, particularly because um, you know a lot better efficiency uh, uh, for our U.S. producer in here. Our, our our pigs per litter has really skyrocketed uh, the last year or so, and so we're efficient, producing more. Um, the demand seems really good. Our export sales are the exact opposite in pork uh, than they are in the beef market. We've had some really good uh, uh, you know, weeks and months of uh, really solid export demand. China's a big part of that uh, on the pork side. Uh, so we're a little bit uh, fairer value there. We've had uh, some rally attempts, but uh, it, it seems like we're just kind of at a at a pretty uh, a pretty fair value in here. Um, uh, honestly, in this uh, in this hog market, um, still seeing some swings back and forth, but uh, it's been uh, way less violent than you know, what the cattle complex has been. I, I would say, though, that, you know, we really need to kind of keep an eye on that. And as producers uh, look at, um, you know, some mixed bags out here on the feed side, three-year lows in corn, but the meal market has been surging higher with these Brazil weather concerns. And so 
you know, it's kind of a mixed bag from a feeder perspective and the on the hog side. And we still need to look for opportunities on rallies out here, um, you know, and probably look out further ahead than what we're used to for some areas that uh, offer some profitability to get some heads for in sure. place. All right, man. Well, Chip, appreciate you coming on the podcast. Folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing over at Blue Reef Agri Marketing. What's the best way to do that? Yeah, best way is just call our office uh, in Morton. It's uh, 309-550-7213. Love to chat with you. Chip, appreciate it, man. We'll talk to you again next week. All right. All right thanks Casey, for having me on, Casey. Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast. See the video version of this over at the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. And go to Moving Iron LLC for everything Moving Iron related. A couple of big announcements coming out here over the next couple of months. Got a new website that should be up here, hopefully, knock on wood. Assuming I get all my stuff done on my end to the website, guys, should be up here in January, but I can't promise you that. So <clears throat> look for that. But sooner or later, it'll be up there, and we'll have a nice, vibrant new picture of Chip Ellinger up there on the website. So check that out. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Chip Ellinger's Camus Modern. Folks, out. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hard work.